uh, I just want to hearken on one thing that you mentioned um, in your remarks earlier, which was how can we make sure that this is a movement and not an event? And that requires some form of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, I mean, we have some of the top faith leaders in the country on this Zoom today. So I think faith has a tremendous role. The churches and mosques, I think, should play a role in this. And I can share my experience as a Muslim and how I view this. And I would love to get Imam Zaid's feedback uh, initially. Um, you know, the Prophet Muhammad in his last sermon said that non-Arab and Arab, there is no superiority over one or the other. Also a white has no superiority over a black, nor a black has any superiority over a white, except by piety and good action. But in that same prophet's lifetime, you have a situation where two of his close friends and companions, uh, they get into an argument where one of the guys says to the other, to Bilal, who's well known, says, you're the son of a black woman. And it's meant as an insult. And Bilal goes to the prophet Muhammad and he goes and he tells the other gentleman, uh, you have traces of ignorance in you. So do you see Imam Zaid, especially in our tradition, especially here in the U.S., where the majority of Muslims are immigrants, oftentimes they don't see the African-American Muslims' contributions? You know, I think, I, I don't know, uh, I, I can be uh, corrected. I don't know if this is an authentic uh, uh, anecdote properly attributed to Jesus, but in, in our Muslim, we have a lot of Muslim stories dealing with Isa or Jesus, peace be upon him. But there's a saying where Jesus was walking with a group of his disciples and they passed a decaying sheep carcass. And one of the disciples looked at it and he, he said, oh, it's the stench is overbearing, overwhelming. And one looked and said, look how mangy his fur is, is covered with maggots. And they were going on in that vein. And then Jesus looked at it. He said, look how white his teeth are. He said, I've conditioned my tongue to uh, find good, something good in every situation. So there definitely, as in any community, you have people who do have the vestiges of this uh, ignorance then they haven't fully assimilated the teachings of the religion as in the anecdote you mentioned. And I think it will be well for you to, to just finish that. So after uh, the prophet told this, uh, Abidhar, peace be upon him, uh, uh, may Allah be pleased, God be pleased with him, that you have this ignorance in you that hasn't been uh, cultured by the religious teachings, he put his head on the ground and, uh, and he asked Bilal to step on his face just out of recognition of the, the gravity of his transgression. Uh, and so to, we can point out this or that incident, but I prefer to look at the wonderful ways that many members of our community, and there's a long way to go for most, but many have shown so much goodwill. And I'll give a few concrete examples. Since the killing of George Floyd, uh, the Zakat Foundation, which is primarily an immigrant organization, uh, this past weekend dis distributed 35,000 pounds of fresh produce in Oakland, California, which is predominantly, uh, to use the current, current phraseology, black and brown city. 35,000 pounds of fresh produce. Uh, uh, one of our community members, African-American Muslim, Amari Gray, father of nine children, was in a head-on collision with a truck. And uh, someone started a launch good campaign for the benefit of uh, Dr. Reverend Dr. Harris and uh, Pastor Barber. That's a, a Muslim crowdfunding site. Over $1 million was raised for that family in 48 hours. Wow. And the overwhelming majority of that came from so-called immigrant communities. And so there are definitely things we can point out. Uh, we had in Oakland, California, uh, a, a 
program where the predominantly immigrants uh, uh, suburban communities, specifically San Ramon and, and Pleasanton, MCC, SRVIC, and the inner city, primarily African-American mosque in Oakland, the Lighthouse Mosque, uh, were doing a Zakat program. Zakat is our alms, uh, tithes, if you will. And in and, and three or four years, we distributed almost half a million dollars in Oakland amongst poor Muslims and poor residents of that community. And so there definitely is a way to go, but I would prefer to uh, point out the positive things that are happening and then let's build on that mm -hmm. because we have enough negativity in the world. And people don't generally join movements when you tell them how bad they are. Mm -hmm. So, you know, let's, let's be, try to be positive, acknowledging, fully acknowledging that indeed there are horror stories, stories and those need to be eliminated and we need to work to eliminate those. But there are so many points of light. And as this darkness of anyone, despite this movement, this uprising, despite the, the changes that we see, the, the departments eliminating planes closed divisions and uh, demilitarizing and making commitments, despite all of that, I think we can, especially people of faith, can see a lot of darkness descending over this land. And the, as people of faith, one of the things we need is to generate as much light as we can to repost that darkness. Wow, that is powerful. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to jump in, Chad, but I have to go ahead and jump in on that one because my brother has really said something that touched my heart because I, one of the struggles of, I will say, the faith community as a whole is to be able to engage the hearts of men and women in, 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 at its core. Why? Because we have become less relevant in their day-to-day -day lives. What, 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 what Imam is, the Imam is just, just, just described is, is the institution becoming a part of people's needs, taking care of the needs of the communities, feeding people, bridging gaps and bandaging their, their emotional wounds when they've been broken, and, and backing all of that up with real material substance. That is important. Um, it, there should be a boldness about people of faith, I think, and not out of arrogance, but um, for, for me as a, as a Protestant Christian to say, um, look, in, the, in, in New Testament teaching, um, the, those who followed Christ were those who were bold. Even when they stood in front of authority, they were bold, not out of their own strength, but because of what they believed because of their faith in their leader who was and is Jesus Christ. Now, I, I have to say that we have abdicated in many ways the voice to reach our people in the various communities of faith because we allow others to dominate the narrative. We, we allow political institutions to, to tell the good stories, you know? Um, it, is, it is the government that's doing all this wonderful stuff. It's, 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 it's federal and state that controls um, the, the, the happiness or sadness of people. I, I think that there must be a, a revival, if you will, within the, within the community of faith that says, no, your faith is still your greatest asset. Your, your, your sense of community with, with your brothers and sisters is still your greatest place of strength and refuge. Look for that. And I, and I think we really do need to sound that horn. And, and, and Mom, thank you. Thank you for that. That is absolutely point on. I know uh, Reverend Dr. Harris is chomping at the bit, but if, if yeah. I very quickly, uh, I think also it's important for us, in addition, faith, definitely. We, we have to, everything we do is built on faith. That's the difference. That's why we are faith-based communities. And, and we're not some, something other than that. And that's not to denigrate or dismiss anything other communities might, do, might be doing. But what is our, to use the language of Adam Smith, the economist, he talked about the wealth of nation. What is this nation's comparative advantage? 
And so as a faith community in this struggle, what is our comparative advantage? What can we do better than anyone else? And I think the language of faith becomes very important here. Of course, we have to have the language of civil rights, human rights, but we also need the language of faith. Otherwise, an essential aspect of our message will be lost because listen, after the statues come down, after the reforms are engaged in or not engaged in, this country is going to be more divided than it ever has been since the Civil War. And if you don't have a party out there who can speak the language of love and the language of hope, it's going to be a hot time in the old town. And, and, and how messages can get distorted. I, just, I was thinking of Marx. That's a great way to interject into a faith-based conversation. But there are those who distort what Marx said. They, they say, oh, Karl Marx said, religion is the opiate of the people. And in other words, religion puts people to sleep and it divorces, moves them away from the concerns of the people. It leads them to pie in, sky, in the sky and the by and by. But that's Marx was misquoted. And that's why narrative is so important. The full statement is religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature. It is the heart of a heartless world, the soul of soulless conditions. It is the opiate of the masses. And, and so in, in other words, when these heartless conditions become even more heartless, who is going to step forward to, to maintain people's heart? When the soulless conditions become more soulless, who's going to put a message out there that can revive people's souls and, and, and give them, uh, renew their faith not only in God, but in each other as communities. And so this is the comparative advantage of religion. And as we do the work that uh, my esteemed uh, fellow panelists have dedicated their lives to, we have to also do that work and not let that work be lost as we go forward. Reverend Dr. Harris. I am chomping at a bit. Um, I would say um, I agree with most of what uh, our two, my two um, brothers have uh, already stated. And I would, you know, I would add that, um, you know, for me, certainly faith is the beginning of, uh, has been the beginning of wisdom. Um, and it is the place where I, I start and end my, uh, my work and I hope my journey uh, in life. Um, and so, um, you know, and so that my goal, my hope, my work is centered on trying to change the hearts and minds of people. That's when that goes back to that narrative again. You know, I, I'm I'm a hundred percent behind those the most radical argument of the protesters in the street. Why? Because uh, because even whether they're doing it from a perspective, uh, you know, because of their doctrine or because of their faith tradition, what they're ultimately arguing for and uh, demanding is this uh, idea of radical inclusion of all life on this planet. And I think um, not just human life, but also because I am a bit of an environmentalist. So it's not, a, it isn't just about human life. It's about get, uh, calling humanity back to a place. It's not necessarily back to a place, but calling humanity to a place where, they, where we actually uh, understand this world to be um, not just for our personal, uh, you know, not just for our personal pocket, but for our own uh, uh, developing of wealth and power and authority over others and over the, you know, the animal kingdom, but it is actually that we be able to live in some manner of harmony where we are, all, where everyone is able to, everyone and every entity created on this earth has the opportunity to live out its full being, to be able to express its full self. And for me, that require that starts with my faith. But I also understand that, and, I, and if I'm honest and fair and truthful, that our faith traditions have sometimes gotten in the way of that, uh, which is why we can say, we, we're saying, you know, to some, 
um, it is a, uh, you know, to some it is a critique that the Black Lives Matter movement and many of these movements are not connected to a particular faith tradition. Well, they're not because they are unwilling to, because they're calling in some ways faith traditions to a more radical um, transformation of even those, of even our faith traditions. And so it, you know, the, it's an opportunity for us to rethink um, and to reflect on what it is we have misinterpreted about our faith, right? That has made it possible for this kind of structural, um, this kind of structural, systemic, ideological, um, uh, uh, you know, insidious kind of thinking that would create a white supremacy and make it a, uh, you know, in many ways, a, uh, a doctrine of a religion. Right. And so, yes, I want to focus on what is beautiful and good about our faith traditions and what we do well. We have great theology. I mean, that's not the problem. It's, it's that we don't live into, those the, into that theology. We had a conversation with a rabbi and a, 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 a Hernessa, a Muslim sister, and, um, and a, you know, a, a, an Episcopal bishop. And, you know, when, they, when we talk about our faith traditions and what our faith traditions, the philosophy and the, and the, and the beliefs and the teachings, I mean, if we could just live there, that we, would, we wouldn't have this problem. The problem is we don't live into those faith traditions. Mm. And so it is, it's, it's a changing of our hearts and minds and it's a changing of the narrative that created this, this, this current situation. And faith has, faith traditions have a great deal of work to do, responsibility, but they also have a great deal to offer. Um, and so uh, I'm hopeful, um, as well as frustrated, as well as angry, <laughs> as well as uh, all the, the emotions that you described in the beginning. Um, but it is my faith that keeps me going, that makes me uh, energize and inspire to get up and to uh, pray for those young people and old people and children and 60 civil rights people that are, are who have been re-energized again and are out protesting with uh, with the young with people now with this uh, with this generation's um, uh, movement um, and so I agree 100 percent we have to do better we have to do more uh, we have to uh, dig deeper and um, and certainly um, the ultimate goal is this, the idea of uh, this radical sense of inclusion and equity where all of God's children, all of God's creation is able to live in harmony um, and no one is uh, left out, put down based on color, um, based on, uh, you know, what kind of creation they are, that all, all are able to express uh, fully who they are in, in this uh, in this beautiful, glorious world we have. Thank you, Reverend. Uh, so this has been an eye-opening conversation for me. I've really appreciated your perspective, your open-minded perspective. Uh, I've appreciated Imam Zaid's optimism and Pastor Barber's friendship and allyship. I want to finish on time, but also I would love to get your last thoughts. So if everyone uh, can just share their last thoughts with the audience in one minute. We'll start with Pastor Bo. Go ahead. Thank you. Well, um, I, I want to leave with everyone that just simply because there is so much to do, simply because the, the, the playing field is so broad, it, that, that is not an excuse to do nothing. So in other words, the, the fact that the, that the work is great, that we have so many to help, that there are so many issues to address, that there are so many places that we have to go. Do not be discouraged, but be steadfast in that. Whatever small difference that can be made in your space, make that difference. Be determined, pers persevere, persevere. It, it, is, it is, I like what Dr. Faith said about the conviction, um, I'm paraphrasing, I'm in putting in my own word, there is a conviction of, of what we call our faith community. Because we have not always been in place when those who were in need needed us. So therefore, be encouraged, go outside your walls, go outside your comfort zone, 
and do not be afraid to speak to power. I will, I will quickly use this piece out of Acts in um, the fourth chapter um, where Peter had to stand before those who were in power. Do not be afraid, but be emboldened and even be expect the fact that you will be challenged again and again to step back and to stop your message. But continue the, the message that all people, all people, regardless of where we come from, because, regardless of the color of our skin, regardless of what we identify as our faith wall, um, that all people have a right to live and to live a life that, is, that has dignity and that has honor. Thank you so much. Dr. Harris. Um, I, I would just say that uh, in, in many ways to echo what um, Pastor Barber said, I think that um, participating at your level of gift, uh, your level of ability, your level of uh, time, whatever is in your hand, use that for the good. Um, you know, pray, um, serve, uh, give, um, learn, at most <laughs> learn, uh, and, uh, and be present. Um, you know, do not absent yourself from the journey and from the fight, from the struggle. Thank you. Imam Zaid? Uh, yeah. I think you know, it is very important for us uh, to uh, remind each other and uh, remind all of those folks who are out there working, struggling, striving uh, to affect positive change in our society that uh, the, the race to justice is a marathon and not a sprint. It's a long race. Take time to grab the water bottles people offer you. If you feel the cramp coming on, pull over to the side and massage the cramp. And so as you run the race, uh, have find joy. Uh, cultivate inner peace. Find the ability to reach out and love uh, others. Otherwise, we won't make it to the finish line. And, and so uh, it's a long, long race. And as Dr. King said, the, the moral arc of the universe, we're talking about this country immediately, or this world, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. So it's a long race. And get a nice pace, don't burn yourself out, and enjoy the scenery, and keep moving. And thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Shay and your team. It's, it's a pleasure. Uh, we really appreciate you, Imam Zaid, uh, Reverend Dr. Harris, and Pastor Barber. I'd like to thank all of you on, from the bottom of my heart, and I'd also like to thank the audience uh, on behalf of American Muslim Institution. We look forward to putting these types of programs together to build bridges within our community, and now more than ever, that's really important.